It's probably difficult for to today's generation to understand how the Pentecostals felt about that. Suddenly God starts baptising in the spirit Roman Catholics and all the Pentecostals are saying, well, you didn't ask us permission to do that. But it was quite amazing the way that our leaders were a bit suspicious of it, basically because they had little doctrine, little understanding of what they were receiving. And so what they were teaching in relation to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking with other tongues and issues of this kind were, were so foreign to what we understood as a Pentecostal fellowship. Not all mainline churches embraced this new experience. And those people moving to Pentecostal churches often did so at great cost. Particularly in smaller communities where you had like farming communities and so on, the whole community would be against you. Um, you've been in a particular church organisation for years and now you're out of that because you've gone Pentecostal and your friends, your support bases, everything was gone. And I know for some it was very traumatic. I hope you brought a lot of voice along with you tonight. But despite this, it was a time of great blessing as many were swept into the Kingdom of God through visiting ministers like Jim Spillman and Frank Houston. Thousands were attracted to Pentecostal rallies in many centres. During the charismatic renewal of the 70s, it was very, very exciting. God was moving in great power in countless churches across the country, and I had the privilege of getting into a lot of those churches and ministering under the power of God. Multitudes in Australia got the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It was wonderful. Tragedy struck the Commonwealth Bible College as the Brisbane River flooded the complex. Many valuable archives were lost, not to mention the hardship the disruption caused the students. After a brave and tireless clean-up effort, it was later to relocate to Katoomba. Teen Challenge saw its beginnings about this time, as the powerful touch of God on the church continued. 1977 marked the 40th year of the Assemblies of God. The conference that year was very significant. For the first time, most delegates stayed in hotels in luxury, instead of the usual campsites. A record number attended, and the theme was Go Forward, and few could have known how true that was. Yonggi Cho inspired everyone greatly with his teaching on goal setting and church growth. After all, he had done it, and was most effective in convincing the church leaders that they could do it too. There was an incredible sense of possibility. For the first time in our fellowship's history, I felt that. It affected my life, and I know it affected the lives of many, many other ministers. From there, we've seen just an, an awesome upsurge of the power of God and church planning in our nation. Despite the positive outlook, there were some administrative issues to deal with. Creative forward thinkers were becoming frustrated by central regimental policies. These had to be dealt with before the freedom to grow could be realised. The time had come for new leadership. Several key leaders were encouraging Andrew Evans to stand for the superintendency. Andrew was seen as one who leads by example, an inspirer, exhorter, willing to step out in faith, and many were hopeful of his appointment. Well, um, it was a surprise to many people. God had been talking to me uh, for weeks and even months ahead of time, and uh, I refused to stand for the position because we had another man there, and I wanted to, uh, not to oppose him. He was the leader, and I didn't want to oppose him. But when he stepped down, I moved in and made myself available. Uh, it was quite an electric kind of conference. Nobody knew which way it was going to go. There were three of us who stood for the, for the position and eventually I got in by two votes. The first thing Andrew did upon his appointment was to honour all those who'd gone before. The brave pioneers who had laid the foundations for the exciting era that lay ahead. I think at that stage we had gone through a certain era where there were certain expectations of leadership. And one of the great challenges that Andrew would have had was to change the expectations of people within the fellowship, as well as marrying those up with the expectations of faith of the future. And that he accomplished very well. With the opening of a new decade, Assemblies of God ministers were brimming with confidence. Now that the new breed of leadership was in place, new goals were set for 40,000 members and 300 assemblies. Together with a bold target of establishing an AOG church in every town of 1,000 people or more, churches began to reveal plans for Bible colleges, retirement homes, Christian schools and outreaches. 
Strategies on all levels were being re-evaluated and fine-tuned. World Missions moved to its new home at Forest Hill. Work among the Aborigines at Halls Creek began to prosper and Students for Christ was established by John Shand. The Chile Conference reported astounding growth. In two years, the movement had seen a 55% increase to 55,000 members. Missions were seeing opportunities opening up all over the world and record missions giving was making it possible to affect the lives of people in 14 countries across five continents. All acknowledged that this was God's work and that He had done it. With their own brand, relative music and unique presentation style, Youth Alive was born out of a need to connect with teenagers. This concept took on quickly and as time passed, clever marketing and cutting edge themes would be employed to capture the attention of youth. The decade of harvest had arrived and with it a sense that every man must serve his generation. The dynamic leadership responsible for the growth of the 70s and 80s, realising that the rich talents of the next generation were ready to be employed. A new move of the Holy Spirit had begun to filter through the churches, originating in North America and the United Kingdom. Again, God was on the move, and as usual in a completely different way. It was time to purify the church, restart the flame of love for the Lord Jesus and make the way clear for the evangelist. Strategies to take us into the next century were constantly requiring reappraisal as new opportunities arose. I have a great sense of excitement about the future of our fellowship. We are we're filled with young people all over the country rising up with a great heart for God, great touch of the Spirit upon them, with holy lifestyle hearts that are open to God and ready to take this nation for the Lord. So I have no doubt at all in my spirit that Assemblies of God, and not the where, the be all, some all, but Assemblies of God here in the kingdom for such a time as this, and God is going to use us to bring glory to his great name. Today, the Assemblies of God in Australia owes much to its forefathers, who set a tremendous example of endurance and faithfulness to the vision. The 1997 figures reveal an adherence and membership of almost 120,000 and more than 800 churches. Missions has re record laws, enabling evangelism in countries too numerous to mention. Over the years, God has seen fit to bless the endeavours of this fellowship, as it has endured the inevitable storms of differing opinions and interpretations, whilst remaining true to its charter. Honour must go to our Lord Jesus Christ, who has interceded on behalf of the enduring Assembly of God pastor, as he forged ahead with the ministry, sometimes with only faith. We've praised to Jesus, who has firstly brought us back into fellowship with the Father and then allowed us the privilege of serving Him as we see thousands swept into the kingdom through His plan and purpose. 